Hello, OIS podcast audience. Happy to be speaking with you again. My name is Rob Rothman. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a clinically practicing glaucoma specialist, uh, and I also am the co-founder and co-managing member of InFocus Capital Partners, which is an ophthalmology-specific venture capital fund. And it is my distinct pleasure to be speaking today uh, with actually one of the first people who I ever met with as a representative of a blossoming venture capital fund many, many years ago. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but today's guest is David Eveleth, who is the uh, founder, uh, president, and CEO of Treefall Therapeutics. Uh, so David, thank you for, for being here with us today. Thank you, Rob. I'm going to get into the whole story um, a little bit later when we get up to it um, about how we first met. Uh, and for full disclosure for the audience, uh, InFocus Capital Partners is an investor in Treefall Therapeutics. So um, we will use that as a, a fully disclosed piece of information because sometimes I may sound a little bit um, exuberant and enthusiastic about the company and David will explain why it might be. But um uh, th that is a backdrop that we are an investor, but I think people probably care more about how you ended up where you are. So you've got a very long, interesting story about how you ended up as the founder of this company. So can you tell everybody a little bit about where you started and about your, your previous experience in pharma and how you ended up here? So, um, you know, I was very fortunate that, uh, my background is, uh, is molecular biology and protein chemistry, but I was very fortunate that my doctoral advisor advised me that uh, if I was interested in the field ecology of meadow voles, I should become a professor. And if I wanted to cure cancer, I should go to biotech. And so I went straight to biotech, um, wound up in a number of different uh, companies, got sucked into big pharma and um, uh, and then eventually was offered the opportunity to head up the, uh, the Latanoprost team at, uh, at Pharmacia. And I thought, having had no experience in ophthalmology, I thought, okay, the eye is just an outpouching of the brain. This is neuroscience. I can deal with this. I'd spent 10 years doing neuroscience. And, and I discovered that, in fact, ophthalmology is almost anything but neuroscience. Um, there are a huge number of products that, uh, and, and cellular processes that are all very, very interesting, but it's sort of, it's a grab bag of everything that happens in the body happens somewhere in the eye. Uh, and, uh, I was fortunate enough to, um, to lead the, the Latanoprost program and then, um, eventually wound up leading the ophthalmology franchise at Pfizer after Pfizer bought Pharmacia and uh, was lucky enough to see uh, and live through several of the fundamental innovations in, uh, in ophthalmology. They don't come along very often. Um, certainly, Latanoprost was one in the glaucoma field. Um, you know, the VEGF revolution for retinal, uh, for AMD. And I'm hoping that we are going to be able to do the same for the treatment of Fuchs disease and corneal edema. So um, that's that's sort of my story. So so first and foremost, I know this is like a family podcast, but what are meadow balls? Yes, small rodents that eat that that run around in the meadow. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like bull yeah. weevils. Yeah, like well, like like mice. But okay. um, just check it. Yeah. Um yeah. uh yeah, I think you chose better. Um so so you have you so you have this whole um you know big pharma background and you know obviously Latanoprost is a disruptive product in the uh, ophthalmology world uh, sort of the um sort of paradigm shift in the world of pharmaceuticals for glaucoma but how does it end up leading to Trefoil where did it come from where did the company come from and how did you find it and decide yeah. to start it you know I think it's important for people to realize the backstory of where this technology came yeah. from so um I guess I have a, a inherent bias towards things that can make a big difference. Uh, maybe that was shaped by my experience with Latanoprost and later on uh, in the VEGF area. Um, but I really um, tend to gravitate towards things that I think can make a, a, a 
big difference, a fundamental advance, and more importantly, to make a big difference for an individual patient. Um, and so, you know, things that restore vision. Now, when I left Pfizer, you know, more than 10 years ago now, um, we started to look around, I and a couple of other folks started to look around for something really innovative that was a new approach to treating disease. And we looked at a lot of different things, but we centered on things that um, in areas where we saw a lot of unmet need on an individual patient basis. That is one, you know, areas where there's no treatment, there's nothing you can do for these patients. Um, and we got attracted to corneal disease and in particular to Fuchs dystrophy um, and asked ourselves, what, um, you know, what can we do to drive this? And I fortunately had very early in my career, spent a lot of time studying growth factors. And it became clear that to, to us, at least, that we ought to look at using growth factors to regenerate and drive uh, wound healing in the cornea. And, um, and so we identified a, um, we first identified the fact that there was a family of growth factors called fibroblast growth factors that were important. Other people had already tread this ground. We knew, for example, that, um, that FGFs could cause the proliferation of corneal endothelial cells after damage in cats that had been demonstrated that they prevent the death of, uh, of corneal endothelial cells in the cornea in a transplantation model that had already been demonstrated. And so we started to look at how we could take something like FGF and make it into a viable drug. And other people have tried to make FGFs into viable drugs before. Uh, so what we looked at was why um, in the past, has this not succeeded? And there are a number of reasons, but one of the important ones is that FGF is quite, or FGF1 at least, is quite unstable. And so, you know, that's not something you like in a drug. We, I'd spent 20 years in big pharma uh, where you have to solve the problem, not only of the molecular approach, but then a molecule that is as suitable as a drug that you can put into uh, the correct formulation that has the right stability that can be produced with appropriate quality, et cetera. And, um, and so we recruited into, uh, into the group, uh, the leader of the growth factor program at Merck, um, and a guy who had spent his life studying stability and structure of FGF, who was a professor at Florida state university and, um, and had produced a number of FGF analogs that were um, that retained the FGF activity, but were super stable. And so we wound up deciding to take a shot at that. We in licensed those compounds from Florida State, and um, and I would be remiss in not mentioning that um, that this group was also heavily assisted by uh, by Ralph Bradshaw, who's one of the founders of the company, who is. Uh, whose lab initially sequenced FGF1. That's the story. So you basically figured out where there was a need, identified the product that would uh, potentially help, and then assembled a team of people who were the best and the brightest in that um, space to try and solve the clinical problems. Right. A fortunate intersection of, of a lot of work that had been done by other people. But it, like many of the innovations in ophthalmology, it's a game of connect the dots. Okay, you're applying something that had been investigated in some other system to an ophthalmic problem where that mechanism works. So what's the current, just for people who are not familiar um, with uh, Fuchs dystrophy uh, and the impact that it has on patients and current treatment options, can you explain what those are? So just very briefly, Fuchs dystrophy, because the, sure. you know, so there are investors who listen to these podcasts, they may not be as familiar with corneal disease, what it yeah. is, what the impact is, and why um, Trefoil's um, you know, path is so important. Yeah. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of a step back from Fuchs and talk more generally about corneal endothelial dystrophy. That is, as most of the ophthalmologists here recognize, the cornea 
is critically important for focusing light onto the retina. Um, it is not just the lens cap that many of the retina guys think it is. It, it it's, uh, <laughs> produces a lot of the refractive power in the eye. And the thickness of the cornea is generally regulated by the function of the endothelial cells. So if those endothelial cells don't work right, you get corneal edema. And, um, and one of the most important ways that those cells don't function correctly is Fuchs, Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy, which is a condition under which the endothelial cells degenerate. Um, these endothelial cells are generally not highly proliferative. They don't regenerate naturally. And so as the endothelial cells degenerate in Fuchs and as um, they're replaced by these deposits of extracellular matrix called Gute, vision declines. You get declines in visual quality as well as, uh, as, well as BCVA. So you get a lot of glare and halos. The corneal, get, the corneal gets edematous. And for Fuchs patients, there's really no cure other than the transplantation of the endothelial layer. And that is actually true also of other forms of endothelial dysfunction. So for example, in a cataract surgery gone wrong, um, the endothelium gets damaged and some of those patients will also go to transplantation. So it's a situation where there's no drug therapy. The only solution is transplantation. It's a solid organ transplant. So like all solid organ transplants, there is the possibility of rejection. So you've got to immunosuppress. Um, you immunosuppress with steroids. And Rob, you'll uh, appreciate what happens when you put hard steroids <laughs> on the eye. Um, and that happens butter. to about you know 30% of these patients. They get glaucoma based upon their steroid exposure. And um, so in general, we were looking at this phenomenon of corneal edema driven by dysfunction of corneal endothelial cells. And for these patients, the only solution is transplantation. Um, that's an end stage thing to do. It's only done by very specialized surgeons. It works pretty well, but again, like all solid organ transplants, there's a possibility of rejection, the graft can fail, and, um, and a significant number of these patients wind up going through multiple grafts. So we saw it as an area of, of critical unmet need. The patients are easy to identify, limited, there's a, a fairly small group of specialized surgeons that treat it. Um, and this was an opportunity literally to make people see again, because these people um, at the end stage, if they don't get a transplant, um, they're not going to be able to see their vision deteriorates significantly. And, um, and they get uh, raging bolus keratopathy, which is also quite painful at the end uh, in, as an end stage disease. So my introduction to ventures for other people who don't know the whole story before the formation of InFocus Capital Partners, uh, my partner, Ron Weiss, and I were uh, investing individually in companies through individual syndicates, um, sort of single purpose vehicle, sort of investment um, opportunities. And uh, my good friend and now chief science advisor for InFocus, uh, Dr. Jody Lux, at the time, uh, who was involved with Tree Falls said, "Hey, you guys are you know running some of these investments. Why don't you meet this guy, David Evaleth? He's going to be in New York, and uh, you know maybe you want to do an ophthalmology investment." We said that sounds like a good idea. So I met David and Jody in the lobby of a hotel somewhere. Do you remember this meeting, David? Mm -hmm. And David, I don't think had the full background on me and started to present a dissertation on <laughs> corneal edema and Fuchs dystrophy. Right. At about one minute into the presentation, I looked at David and I said, you know, I'm an ophthalmologist. I don't know if you know that, but I'm actually an ophthalmologist. And you sat back in your chair and you're like, okay. And you went ahead by like 40 slides, and got, <laughs> right? It's about 40 yeah. slides yeah. And, and got to the last three slides. And I said, I love it. Totally get it. Let's sign an NDA. Let's you know move forward, and we ended up creating a syndicate for investment, you know, into Treefall at that time. And the the thing that ended up, so you're indirectly responsible, just so you know. But the comment that you made at the time that sort of pushed us into thinking more formally about a fund was that you said to me at that meeting, you said, just so you know, what just took us 15 minutes generally takes about three three months with a non ophthalmic 
right. investor. It's three yeah. months. We did I, it in I'd 15 had, minutes. I'd had the experience of uh, going to a venture capitalist and doing the whole thing and saying, and this is about Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy, which is a rare disease. It's Fuchs dystrophy. And he leans back in his chair and he says, it must be rare. In my 20 years of practice as a neurologist, I never saw a case. Yeah. Okay, let's start at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's how it happened. So, yeah. so that was the thing. And then after we decided to do the syndicate, we said, hey, maybe we understand this ophthalmology stuff pretty well being ophthalmologists. And maybe we should figure out how to focus the, you know, make that the focus of our investment uh, thesis. But anyway, so you're indirectly responsible. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. But uh but but truthfully, I, I you know I think the significance of the disease is somewhat understated. Actually, believe it or not, you know it's we see the patients who have to undergo corneal transplantation, and to a bigger degree, I think that more so than the natural progression of Fuchs into corneal uh, edema and visual loss is the impact of Fuchs dystrophy after cataract surgery. Even with modern cataract surgical techniques using femtosecond lasers and um, improved phaco emulsification technology, we see patients who develop irreversible corneal blindness, basically, you know, from uh, the effects of having intraocular surgery. And that happens quite frequently. And I think I'm correct in stating that um, full thickness and partial corneal transplantation. So partial mm -hmm. corneal transplantation is now the primary treatment for um, corneal blindness from fugues is the number one transplant procedure in the United States, right? And there's yes. more corneal well, transplant than anything. It's the most common, it's the most commonly done solid organ transplant worldwide. They're about, right. yeah. But by like an order of magnitude, right? Okay. It, so you're it, talking about so you know for for the investment thesis at least, and from the clinical impact, you know, as an ophthalmologist, you know, I'm a glaucoma specialist. I I send these cases to to my cornea colleagues, but ultimately we see them all the time. You're talking about the potential to medically treat and potentially eliminate the most common tissue transplant that we perform in the plant on the planet. Yes. That's ultimately the big picture concept here is that if we can fix this without surgery, not only can we improve the lives of patients because we can eliminate the need for surgery, but we can also provide access to this in a much simpler way to people who don't necessarily have access to corneal transplantation across right. the planet. So for us, it was not only an you know, investment opportunity, it was also a global health sort of impactful position yeah. that we took that we could theoretically help propagate science that could change global blindness across the globe. And I think that's the real impact of, of Fuchs dystrophy and corneal disease. Obviously, you're going to tell us a little bit more about how the company's progressed and other indications that you mm -hmm. have for the for the technology. But the point is that you can't, I don't think it can be stated clearly enough. That this is a, a huge global health issue and and something that um, if we were able to fix this problem without surgery, it would have an impact on, you know, hundreds of thousands of patients across the globe who are probably walking around corneally blind that could be, could be helped. So anyway, that was, that was how we, how we processed it. Yeah. So, I mean, our goal, uh, certainly is to make sure that, um, patients who are at risk of getting a transplant that is on the way, you know, on the way down that path don't get there and that we can treat them before that. And I, and I also uh, want to follow up on what you said about cataract surgery. I mean, cataract surgery is one of the great innovations of ophthalmology, right? It's one of those, one of the very few things that doctors do at any, in any specialty where, you know, the patient basically gets up off the table and says, gee, doc, I'm cured. Right. right? And for nine, you know, for a huge proportion of cataract patients, that's what happens. But there are some, as you mentioned, there, that's not what happens. And their corneas decompensate and they have endothelial failure. And some of those patients are headed for transplant. And, you know, this common thread between Fuchs dystrophy and corneal decompensation following cataract surgery is we believe that our drug is common to those, uh, to those processes and we can fix both of those things. And that is we can take a patient who is at high risk, either because they have early Fuchs or for that matter, because they have uh, a shallow chamber or a uh, Burnescent cataract, and we can prevent them from experiencing corneal edema following that 
corneal transplant. And as you say, it is a worldwide problem, not corneal transplant, cataract surgery, but it is a worldwide problem because transplanted tissue is not available or transplantable tissue, donor tissue is not available worldwide. And um, the incidence of uh, corneal edema due to endothelial failure, either from cataract surgery or uh, from underlying Fuchs is, um, is quite different in other parts of the world. And there is a high need in a lot of, uh, uh, of areas for something that can medically treat these patients without having to go to tissue transplantation. I mean, that's, that was, that was, that's the reason we're here, right? It's the reason we're here as an investor and it's the reason we're excited. Can you update um, the listening audience on where you're at clinically? Because there's some exciting yeah. data that so, you have that I think you yeah. can share and, yeah. um, you know, sort of tell people how far along you've come. So um, we have completed a phase two study of the use of the drug in, um, in, a, a surgical procedure called DSO or decimate stripping only in Fuchs endothelial dystrophy patients and in cataract. That is, we took a study where we, uh, we identified patients who are suitable for DSO and we gave those patients a DSO with drug. And we gave some of those patients a DSO and a cataract surgery, what they call a triple procedure or a combination procedure. Um, and, and gave them drug. And we were able to demonstrate that there is a dose-related reduction in corneal edema in those patients, um, and that we could, uh, we could get those DSO patients, and DSO being a surgery that is a replacement for transplantation without the need for donor tissue, and we could get those patients to recover from that surgery as well as, as quickly as, uh, they would have if they had gotten a transplant. So the, the average time to recovery in, in DSO without a drug adjuvant is generally quite long, can be three months or more. And we were able to shorten that time with the drug to a time comparable to that recovery time in DSEC, um, so transplantation. Importantly, what we also demonstrated was that when we gave, when we compare the patients that got that combination surgery, that is, they got cataract surgery as well as the DSO, they did not experience the additional corneal edema that you would expect. These are all high, very high-risk patients because they're end-stage Fuchs patients, right? They're DSO candidates. And you would expect in that population for the performance of a cataract operation to induce significant edema. And so we look to see if there was edema induced beyond that induced by the DSO procedure itself, which does induce edema. And the answer was no. So that study provided us evidence both that we could solve the problem for those patients that need a transplant that have gotten so bad that they need a transplant and, and give them a DSO instead of a transplant, but also solve the problem of patients that are at risk, maybe earlier Fuchs patients who weren't ready for transplant or again, patients that are at high risk for other reasons, including brunescent cataracts and diabetes and things like that, and reduce the edema, the corneal decompensation secondary to those cataract surgeries. So we're very excited about all of that data and now moving into trying to show that, uh, that the drug does in fact work to manage corneal decompensation, to manage endothelial damage and the resultant edema in patients that are undergoing cataract surgery that have these risk factors for the um, uh, for edema secondary to cataract surgery. Again, this is the most common reason why cataract surgery doesn't work as expected. Um, it's the most common reason patients don't get the G doc I'm cured. And so um, and so that in combination with um, with those DSO patients, uh, you know, the replacement for transplant, we think that we can um, we can make a lot of people see better. And that's what's right. important. It's, at the end of the day, you got to make people see better. And right. so I think we have something that's going to be able to make a lot of people see better. And that's, and, and again, just to, just to reiterate, because I think it, I, I want to make it clear to people who listen here, the data has already supported that we may not need to do 
endothelial transplantation anymore. A mm -hmm. DSO procedure for people who don't know is where you basically just take the damaged endothelial tissue off the cornea and let cells sort of naturally migrate into fill in the gaps there and hope that there's enough sort of movement of cells uh, to try and create a you know a functioning healthy endothelial endothelial cell layer the patients who have transplantation generally were doing better than dso patients but now the addition of trefoil's drug to a dso procedure is producing results that are better than than or equivalent to at least um transplantation so now at least you're not necessarily eliminating the need for surgery but you are certainly showing that you can eliminate the need for surgery with transplanted tissue yeah, and, and it eliminates, if you go down that path for patients that are Fuchs patients and who are candidates for transplant, it then eliminates the transplant. So you don't need transplanted tissue, but then it also eliminates the need for immunosuppression. So you don't get the secondary glaucoma and you can't have, you know, grafts can't fail or be rejected if there's no graft. So, right. um, the, so this is a, an all around win for patients. Um, and, um, and this is also a big burden on the on the healthcare system in the sense that these patients require chronic uh, visits, you know, frequent visits to the ophthalmologist, and um, and transplantation as a procedure is a fairly expensive procedure. Right. Yep. No. I mean, obviously, and again, you want to think, forget you know, locally to the insurer system in the United States and into developed countries where obviously they would love to not have to pay for a corneal transplantation, even partial corneal transplantation or DSEC costs mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of dollars to harvest the tissue, yeah. preserve the tissue, and use the tissue in a in a in another human being, eliminating that cost. But again, in areas where tissue isn't available because there is right. no effective transplant program across the globe, you're talking about the ability to do a procedure, which is relatively simple to perform by a trained cornea specialist with the addition right. of the trefoils product, it produces results as if they had gotten a healthy piece of tissue. And I think that's really the, the key there that this will hopefully is the first step towards eliminating a significant cause of, uh, you know, ocular tissue transplantation. And you've shown that that's now possible. Right. Right. Yeah, and we want to do that for both uh, Fuchs patients and for patients that um, that are at risk of corneal decompensation secondary to cataract surgery. Right. So um, we think it's it's going to work. We have clinical evidence now that it's effective in both of those situations, and uh, and we expect to move forward uh, to try and prevent post surgical edema in from whatever cause. Right. So that's, again, so um, failure, again, for the audience that may not be as familiar, failure of the cornea, after cataract, the most common cause for corneal transplantation is cataract surgery, right? So that's the most common reason that people need corneal transplantation is because they undergo cataract surgery and there is a decompensation of the tissue in the eye. So again, without disclosing too much about what trefoil is doing, my assumption would be if I was listening to this, that you're somehow going to combine your product with cataract procedures and show that fewer patients develop corneal edema and potentially right. no patients will develop corneal edema. That's right. The, this data from the STORM study strongly supports the idea that we can prevent that um, that post-surgical edema in patients that are getting cataract surgery that are at risk because they have Fuchs. I mean, we right. did it. So yep. um, we're, we're very hopeful for that. And, um, uh, and so because these patients are really easily identifiable, I mean, again, we're not talking about all cataract patients. We're talking about a subset of patients that have identifiable risk factors, but these are easily identifiable risk factors. So now, uh, based on the success of uh, of the inside the eye work, what are your thoughts on other applications for the eye, maybe yeah. even on the epithelium outside of the eye? Uh, what are your plans <clears throat> for pursuing those as well? So we've spent a considerable amount of effort um, thinking about uh, where else this could be useful. After all, we've demonstrated that uh, the compound is protective and proliferative and pro-migratory for the endothelial cells. There's a rationale that it should be for epithelial cells as well. And we have data, which has been published, that, that formulating this molecule as an eye drop, using this approach uh, as an eye drop, is effective in chemical burns to the cornea, uh, to the corneal outside surface instead of the inside of the cornea, the outside of the, of the cornea, the epithelial surface. And in fact, that it also works to reduce 
uh, herpetic keratopathy, that is uh, applying it to animal in an animal model where the animals are undergoing uh, an active herpetic, uh, uh, active herpetic lesions reduces both the keratitis and the blepharitis in these animals. And one of the things that was most interesting to us in those experiments was that um, it wasn't just protecting and proliferating epithelial cells, which was what we thought was going to be the mechanism there. But we discovered that in the context of that experiment, that the drug was polarizing macrophages. It was actually acting through an immunomodulatory activity by polarizing macrophages from the M1 to the M2 phenotype. That is the M1 phenotype of macrophages being the, the phenotype that causes a lot of the cell damage. Uh, the tissue damage associated with things like infections, and the M2 being the macrophages that come in afterwards and clean up. Uh, and so uh, we've since uh, confirmed that that effect works. It's a direct effect. The macrophages have FGF receptors, and it's a direct effect on those macrophages, and it works in human macrophages as well. So that raises the possibility um, or gives us a rationale to start testing it in diseases where there is any disease in essence, where there is an inflammatory destruction of the epithelial layer. And that would include Sjogren's syndrome, which is quite an important driver of, of epithelial damage, as well as herpetic keratopathy and neurotrophic keratitis, and uh, obviously chemical burns, since we demonstrated that, that it works in chemical burns. So we're excited about that. We're actually in the clinic with that, uh, with those eye drops, and we hope to be able to show you some clinical data, uh, you know, in, in a while, in, in 2023. <laughs> we're, we're anxiously waiting, but, you know, I think one of the things that people, um, you know, may not also realize, and, and again, it's a question that comes up quite frequently when you talk about investment in pharmaceuticals is side effect profile. And this is an engineered form of something naturally occurring in the human body. Mm -hmm. Have you seen anything that even looks like remotely like a side effect? So, so we haven't, um, we have done, um, so the, Endothelial product is administered by intracameral injection. Um, we've now done more than 300 intracameral injections of the drug at various doses, repetitive injections. Uh, I would point out that its use in decimus stripping only and in the prevention of edema secondary to cataract surgery requires only one application of drug, but we have tested multiple applications of drug and we do not see any um, significant adverse events um, we've looked fairly carefully for that. Um, one of the great things about evaluating adverse events in an ophthalmic setting, especially in a corneal setting, is that if there were, uh, if there were adverse events, they're easy to see because you can see in. Um, and we have not seen any uh, significant adverse events. The safety profile looks very, very clean. And, um, and so far in our phase one series with the topical eye drop, we also haven't seen any. But you know we're early in the in the dose escalation phase on that one, uh, so we're pretty happy about that. The drug appears to be very safe, and um, uh, and more importantly, the drug appears to work with at least on the endothelial cells. It works with a fairly brief exposure to drug. Um, you know we we've did in the DSO study we inject the drug just once and it produces that significant effect on corneal edema and that significant protective effect that, that's the acceleration of the recovery of vision. So I'm gonna be, be a proud papa here for a minute and just let the audience know that at the um, uh, year end OIS meeting in, in San Diego this year, which was a fantastic meeting and, and hopefully people will uh, make it their business to attend um, future uh, OIS uh, end of year meetings. Um, uh, Trefoil was uh, awarded with one of the innovation awards from um, the group of uh, analysts and investment bankers that were present, um, sort of highlighting their enthusiasm for this to be a um, high probability of success investment target uh, based on the science and the results so far. And I, as a you know, as a, a member of Infocus and and one of the early investors, couldn't be more proud of the progress that that you and Shailen and the whole team have made. Um, it's incredibly exciting to be a part of something that could be truly disruptive in the, in the um, treatment of ophthalmic disease. And I think that 
when you look at you know how safe this product is, how successful it has been so far, the clinical programs that you're currently undertaking, where you're going, that this is going to be the um, is going to be an incredibly successful uh, endeavor that's going to help better the lives of ophthalmology patients across the planet. So um, I think with that, and on behalf of the entire um, you know audience, I would like to thank you uh, for being with us today, for sharing. Uh, tree falls uh, process and success. And I uh, can't wait until you can come back on a podcast down the road and give us some updates on the continued process and uh, development of um, therapy for both um, inside the eye and outside the eye corneal disease. So David, thank you again for your time today. All right. Thank you, Rob. It's been great. 